if you play D&D enough, eventually you will have a session that's, didn't we already do this? Didn't we do this last episode? Are we going to have two downer episodes in a row? Might as well rip off the band-aid. This episode is about losing, and unlike Slog, I actually do have some advice on how to avoid, or minimize, losing. But first, let's define our terms. For the purposes of this discussion, failing is not achieving an objective. There are lots of ways to fail without the party ever losing a character. You fail to stop the ritual. You fail to save the blacksmith's daughter. You fail to save the town or stop the assassination. Fail to catch a murderer before he kills again. Or fail to get to the temple before the enemy party, and now they have the artifact. All of that is possible without anyone in the party dying. Losing, on the other hand, is what happens when the party wipes. Everyone is dead, or maybe only you lost a character, your character is dead, or everyone's captured. All of these things suck. Losing sucks. And if you play often enough, sooner or later you're going to lose. When that happens, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to blame the other players, the dungeon master, or yourself. Okay, that's natural. It sucks when things go bad. Awfully dramatic, though, isn't it? I've been on both sides of dozens of encounters where the players lost, and I've noticed something over the years. It always sucks. Losing always sucks. But there is losing that's dramatic, and losing that makes you feel stupid. Both are unpleasant, but one is memorable and sometimes satisfying. The other is profoundly unfun. I don't know which is the most common reason for feeling stupid, but it is one of two things. I don't even know why we're doing this. Players can and do get themselves into situations where they go into an encounter for no reason other than because it's there, because it's the next one, because they stumbled onto it. They didn't have a clear goal other than more XP and treasure. And look, just knowing that is good, knowing the only reason we're down here is for XP and treasure is good, because it means you're not going to fight to the death. Let's get out of here. We were only down here for treasure and XP, and this isn't worth it. Having a clear goal is important because it sets expectations. Dying in the attempt to save someone, to stop a ritual or save the world, all of this makes sense. But dying just because you are curious about what's in the next room? When that happens, you will hate it. Unless you're just not that attached to your character. Back in the day, you never really expected a new character to live, so we tended to be very brash and irrational at low levels and then incredibly risk-averse at high levels. The lesson here isn't always have a clear goal, because that's not reasonable and it's not always fun. But the lesson is be mindful. When you casually walk into the next room and discover there's a Medusa in there, that's when it's time to think about retreating. Don't wait until you're unconscious. It's too late. It's just a knack. Recognizing that uh-oh moment where no plan intersects with super hard encounter. Wait, what was our plan again? This competes with, I don't even know why we're doing this, for the most common reason failure is unfun. Because you never felt like a team, cooperating, working with a purpose. You felt like a bunch of randomly assembled grabastic characters and not listening to each other, not coordinating, no plan. Even if your plan falls apart in the first round of combat, even if your plan is revealed to be flawed as soon as initiative is called, the act of planning is a good exercise because it requires communicating, listening, building consensus, leadership. All those things will be useful in the battle even if the plan proves worthless. There's a famous phrase, no plan survives contact with the enemy. But a better quote is from Eisenhower, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. A lot of total party kills I've witnessed from both sides of the screen. You don't need a TPK to destroy a campaign. Sometimes it only takes one death for the group to feel like it's not worth continuing. A lot of party wipes I've experienced were because the players just walked into the next room. No plan, no scouting, no listening, no searching, never interrogated the prisoner. No sense that maybe the encounters were getting tougher and they were low on resources. If that's never happened to you, good. But when it does, will suck because you will blame yourself and feel dumb. Why didn't we stop and think about this? Losing doesn't feel as bad as feeling stupid, which is funny because I think we all feel stupid all the time. You'd think we'd be used to it by now. Plans and goals are related. It's easier to have a plan if you have a clear goal. And one thing I've noticed is that players without a plan and without a goal tend to get frustrated because they spend the entire battle reacting. They never feel like they have momentum. They're always dealing with a problem instead of being the problem the bad guys have to deal with. If you have these two things, a goal and a plan, you are in good shape, regardless of whatever's in the next room. But there's another tool I rarely see deployed that will save you a lot of time. Retreat. Actually, let's not call it that. Retreat has a negative connotation. Sounds like failing. Let's call it retrograde progress. 
In my long and lengthy experience as a player and a DM, retreat comes in six stages. The point in the battle where it became clear you were outmatched and it was time to run while everyone was still alive. Three rounds later, someone suggests retreating. Two rounds after that, a character falls unconscious and now two or more players are talking about retreating. The next round, another character falls unconscious and a player finally declares their intention to retreat. The next round, that player is killed. The remaining players then run around like chickens with their heads cut off, one of them by sheer luck manages to escape, and the rest of the party is dead or captured. Someone at this point says, I said we should retreat, why didn't we retreat? And someone else responds, well, instead of saying we should retreat, why didn't you retreat? This is the crux of the issue. The best advice I can give you, never get involved in a land war in Asia. The second best advice I can give you is, don't talk about retreating, retreat. Don't wait to build consensus, it will never come. Building consensus relies at least in part in some degree of enthusiasm, and you're not going to get people enthusiastic about running away. Players don't like retreating, regardless of how useful it is. It feels like giving up. But when one player leads, when one player says the five magic words, other players follow. What are the five magic words? Oh, well, surely you know. Break! We are leaving! You got it. One mistake players make is treating D&D like a war game, a game with rules that force both sides in the battle to be roughly equal in power. Pretty much any game you play, card games, board games, video games, the expectation is if you're fighting something, there is some design in the background making the battle fair. This is not true for D&D, and assuming this often leads to... Bum, 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 bum. Certain death! Correct. Even if you use the rules for building encounters in the DMG, which I do not, those rules are merely guidelines and cannot really cover every eventuality. I don't really believe D&D is or should be about fair fights because your characters exist in a world that's masquerading as real and the real world doesn't have fair fights. Often the battles are imbalanced in favor of the players because that makes them feel badass. But sometimes the battles are imbalanced against them. The bad guys want to win. That attitude, the bad guys want to win, happens in this box. It's bounded. Outside the box are absurd, implausible fights where first-level characters fight beholders. That's just... That's incredibly poor sportsmanship on behalf of the DM. But there's an awful lot inside that box, including crazy fights I have no idea how the players will beat. Let's get to some examples, both from my current campaign. The first night we played in my current Night Below campaign, the players had an epic battle against skeletons and zombies in the tavern. It was the middle of the night, and when they were done, they were low on spells, low on hit points, but high on victory. Then they heard glass shattering somewhere out in the village, now shrouded by a mysterious fog. That's redundant, by the way. All fog in D&D is mysterious. It's never just foggy. It's never just a pool of water. It's never just a full moon. Beware the moon, lads. That dude was an experienced D&D player. I did this on purpose. I got them low on resources, but high on victory, and then placed before them an impossible task. I gave him an impossible task. Because that's dramatic. Drama is a question with tension. Will the heroes... If there's no tension in the question, there's no drama. To me, it's a kind of seduction, putting this delicious mystery in front of the players just when they are least equipped to deal with it. Oh, come on. Just one more bite. It's only a waffer thing. I'll often say something like, Oh, well, if you guys are going to be cowards, we can skip till tomorrow morning when you'll be rested and ready and all the excitement will be over and there'll be no XP and no treasure. I do this because no matter how much I taunt them, the players know the decision is up to them. They know I think they should not listen to me, and that's part of the fun. Given how beaten up they were, I literally thought they were going to stay in the inn and rest. But they went out into the night to rescue whoever was being attacked. Yeah, well, only because you taunted them. I would never do that. You're a terrible person. Many people would agree with that. In the battle that ensued against Lady Serial's minions, which I think I've talked about elsewhere, it seemed clear the players were badly outmatched. And then something interesting happened. The Archer Ranger decided to make a run for it. This seemed a perfectly sensible decision to me, but the Archer Ranger didn't really commit. Because he didn't want to retreat, he wanted the team to retreat. So he stayed at the edge of his range, bow in hand, ready to cover the other players as they ran. Then Keck, the Dwarven Cleric, went down, unconscious. Phil's wizard Skoros wanted to save him. Keck failed one saving throw, then the next. Then the druid went down. At this point, the archer ranger really wanted to retreat, but Phil refused to leave. He was going to stay and fight to the death, if need be, because, as he said, I'm not going to leave my friends behind. 
I thought that was a perfectly valid reason to commit suicide by a zombie. Stay behind defending your wounded friend. And I am 100% certain that if Phil's wizard had died right then, Phil would have been 100% okay with it because it was his choice. He knew what he was doing and it was dramatic. Interestingly, the Archer Rangers player was really, really upset by all this. He was upset that Phil refused to retreat. He felt like, we agreed we needed to retreat and now you're not retreating. Well, because the test had changed. Now Keck was dying, and Skoros the wizard wasn't going to leave him behind. Phil said things like, If you want to be a coward and run, that's your business. But I am not a coward. I am not afraid to die defending my friends. Now this is exactly what I would have said. You know, if you're going to run, run. But don't run and act like it's bravery. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Of course, the archer ranger reasonably said, This isn't bravery, it's stupidity. And it became a huge thing, like... All week after that, days after the game was over, we were still arguing about it. But the next round, Keck rolled a 20 on his death saving throw, and he was conscious. He healed the druid, and now the entire party was conscious, and the tide of battle turned. They won. Against impossible odds, they won. I decided that 20 meant Ord, the god of the dwarves, Ord who created the world, had a plan for Keck. Keck is the chosen of Ord, I decided. That situation could have gone very badly, but I know for a fact, if Phil's wizard had died defending his friend, he would have thought it was epic, a suitably heroic way to die. Memorable and dramatic. He was defending his friend and the town. One player felt like he had a clear goal, save his friend or die trying. For him, it was going to be memorable and epic no matter what happened. Another player didn't know why they were fighting. There was no plan, and even though they won, he hated it. He argued about it for days. Compare this to just a couple weeks ago. These same characters, more or less, six levels later are deep in the Underdark, trying to kill a bunch of Darrow, mad dwarves, in order to free some slaves and gain some allies. After meeting little resistance because of good planning and tactics, they walk into the royal chamber of the Darrow. There, the Darrow savants, the lords of the Darrow, five sorcerers between 9th and 11th level, wait for them with a mind flare. They just walked in there, no scouting, no planning, Never interrogated the prisoner, and they were low on hit points, some very low, and low on spells. Anna's bard was completely out. It was an epic battle. Count Nicodemus and Sir Lanavar charged the Mind Flayers, but didn't have enough movement left over to attack. The Mind Flayer stunned half the party. That was a huge blow. One of the lords of the Darrow cast Wall of Fire, cutting off the rest of the party. Now two characters, the melee fighters, are engaged with the enemy, while the rest of the party is behind a Wall of Fire that is cutting off line of sight. So the rest of the party, all spellcasters, can't help their friends. Maybe they could just jump through the wall of fire, but they don't know how much damage it does, and they're already low on hit points. So they spend four rounds trying to dispel the wall. Seems like a lot of time wasted, but they only needed to roll above a nine, and they couldn't do it. Each round, it seemed like the most logical thing to do was cast Dispel Magic again. What are the odds that we'll fail to roll above a nine? Turned out to be 100%. Lots of epic stuff happened in that battle. At one point, one of the Darrow savants cast Telekinesis to grab Lord Nicodemus and drag him into the Wall of Fire. That seemed profoundly unsportsmanlike. I may recount this whole thing in a campaign diary later, but after weathering all of the Darrow's 5th level spells and then all of their 4th level spells, the fireballs came out and the party dropped unconscious. Well, not Count Nicodemus, he had earlier failed a saving throw against Banishment, and is now back in the mundane world preparing for the siege of Castle Rend. That's another story. The party was captured, but not dead. The Darrow are slavers and eager to deliver these characters to the Mind Flayers in the city of the Glass Pool. They had lost, and lost badly, and while some of the players thought it was an epic battle, super memorable, looking forward to escaping, some of the players thought it sucked. During the battle, there was a lot of complaining, complaining about how unfair the battle was, about how powerful these Darrow were compared to the others. At one point, one player complained that I was breaking the rules of magic by having an invisible Darrow casting spells and remaining invisible. All I said was, I am not breaking the rules of magic, even though it would have been well within my purview to do so. Moments later, the other players discovered there was a spell called Greater Invisibility. While they were complaining, I was not in the least bit bothered or worried. If I felt like I was being unfair, if I had felt like I had poorly designed the encounter, I would have felt bad and I would have adjusted the encounter. But that's not why they were complaining. They were complaining because they were losing. I've played a lot of League of Legends and something happens in every game. One side starts losing, and one side starts complaining. Strangely, the side that complains is always the losing side, and equally baffling, the complaining begins exactly at the moment the losing begins. Why do they only start complaining once they start losing? It's impossible to say. I'm sure it's pure coincidence. The complaining is natural. Losing sucks. 
Let them complain, but do not explain. If they say the battle is unfair, agree with them. Yeah, this is a son of a bitch. I have no idea how you'll survive. I don't know how you survived. But here's the thing. These players, this group, have gotten out of crazy encounters where I literally thought, they're all gonna die if they don't do something amazing. And they've never failed, um, before now, to do something amazing. Typically because they've busted out stuff I didn't know they could do, or they spent time getting good intelligence on the enemy, or they successfully surprised the enemy. But this battle, they literally just walked into the Darrow throne room, no scouting, no preparation, some of them very badly wounded, no spells left, and these Darrow were powerful spellcasters. The players who had a bad time all talked, later, after blaming me, about how unprepared they were. If they had to fight these same guys again, and they did have to fight them again, but that's another story, they wouldn't do it all at once. They'd lure them out one by one, wait for them to sleep, wait for them to eat, change the conditions of the test. Good plan. No one died during that battle. The Darrow are slavers, after all. They were captured and led down to the city of the Glass Pool, and some interesting stuff happened that I think I'm going to save for a campaign diary later. I know I owe you folks a whole bunch of campaign diaries. I promise somehow I will find a way to get caught up. My friend Mark once said, Matt, when you kill one of my characters, I didn't kill him, by the way, the Knowles killed him, I'm really pissed at you for like 30 minutes. Do not try and defend yourself. That just makes things worse. Just let me be pissed at you, and 30 minutes later I'll be excited about my new character. This is wisdom. The reaction, anger, blame, these are natural. That's human nature, no point in acting like it's not. Blame is one of those magical things that increases the more people there are to share it. Unlike pizza. But, you know, get over it. Feel bad, yell at each other, and move on. There's more gaming to be had, get to it. Make a new character, you'll love your new character. When my friend Phil's first character, Skaros, died, one of the other players was really upset because he thought that was the end of the campaign. Remember, it's D&D. Death isn't the end. Just make a new character. We play these characters, we inhabit them, we create them, we control them. Over the course of weeks and months, it's perfectly natural to feel like we know them just like any fictional character. Better. When they die, we feel it. Lots of players, as an exercise, and I think a healthy one, make a second character while playing the first. When it looks like they are all about to die, just start rolling a new PC. That exercise helps detach you a little bit from your first character so that... If something happens, it doesn't feel like the end of the world. It doesn't feel like the end of the campaign. Because it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the campaign. There's always more D&D. You can play every week for the rest of your life and never run out. So go do it. That's the episode on losing, folks. I hope it never happens to you. But like the slog video, if it does, I hope you think back to this video and it saves you a little bit of strife. And maybe when you walk into that room and discover there's a Medusa there and you're all only first level, you'll say, hey, I have an idea. Let's get the hell out of here. Retreat is always an option. I know the pace of videos has slowed down. I promise you once I get out from under all the work I have taken on, the video rate will increase. And I think you'll all be really interested and happy with the top secret project I'm working on. Uh, I'm hoping this video will go up tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, and then Saturday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time. I am going to have a live stream where, and mind you, of course, most of you watching this will be watching it after tomorrow morning, in which case there'll be a video online. But we're going to get on Twitch tomorrow night. 7 p.m. and we're going to go over we're going to read live uh this actually tale hang on stand by we're going to go over this tales from the yawning portal it's a big adventure book it's got seven different adventures in it it just came out from wizards of the coast all of the adventures in here i have either run played in or read with the intention of running we did one of these for volo's guide to monsters it was pretty successful we'll do another one for tales from the yawning portal and this time i was prepared i bought three extra copies i'm going to keep one for myself don't be greedy three extra copies that i'm going to give away tomorrow live on the stream 7 p.m pacific time uh so i again many of you are going to be watching this video after that in which case ideally if everything goes well there will be the video on demand in the youtube list this episode was brought to you by my novels. I am a fantasy writer. I've got two novels out. You can come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. Each book is four bucks, of which I see three bucks. So if you buy both books, you're throwing me six bucks, which is working out pretty well, by the way. One of the things that has caused the flow of videos to slow down is the fact that I'm basically building a multi-camera television studio to do D&D streaming again. I'm taking it very seriously. I like a challenge. I don't like having left that project, the old D&D stream, to die just because we couldn't master the technology. That was mostly the problem. And I have a lot of ideas about how to make streaming D&D fun for everybody, including the people playing and the people watching. And to do that on the streaming 
terms, not the terms of D&D, if that makes any sense. You'll see what I mean uh, if I get this up and running, which we better because I've spent a lot of money on it. It's going to be a while. We've got a lot more tests to do audio and video tests. And then I'm going to do a one shot where we play a single adventure, me and my friends, and I will give you plenty of warning before that so you will know when it goes live. As depressing a subject as it can be, I hope you enjoyed the episode on losing. Next episode, we're going to talk about prepping an adventure, and we're going to do that because I did a poll on Twitter, and I said, do you guys want to see prepping an adventure, or do you want to see the next episode in the politics series? And even though a lot of people voted for both, prepping an adventure won, so that's one of the things you get if you follow me on Twitter, at Matt Colville. Again, there'll be a link in the doobly-doo. I know a lot of people want to see how I prep a pre-made adventure, something you buy and download and then read. Uh, how do I take it apart? How do I put it back together? I think that'll be super useful. I actually plan on doing a bunch of these. We'll probably take all the adventures that I love and I will show you how I would prep them. Also, I encourage you to come by my subreddit slash r slash Matt Covell. It's a great place to ask me questions or just ask questions about D&D in general. You'll get answers. I read every message on there, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of people on there now reading it all the time. So you'll get good answers regardless of whether I have time to respond or not, because typically I do not have time to respond. I get tons of messages now, literally dozens of messages a day. I get direct messages on Twitter. I get people tweeting at me and asking questions. I get emails. I get direct messages on YouTube. I almost never have time to respond because there's no way to respond to all this and get everything else done I want during my day or week. So the subreddit is a great compromise. Come by, ask your questions, and you will get good answers, even if they're not from me. Next episode, we prep against the cult of the reptile god. Until then, peace out.